Okay, let's go. <laughs> that makes you happy. It's not legal advice, but it will have to suffice because it's copyright, woman, copyright, woman, copyright, woman. All right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. So my name is Chris Morrison. My name's Jane Secker. Um, and we are the co-chairs of the Association for Learning Technologies Copyright and Online Learning Special Interest Group. And this is our 58th webinar. 58th webinar that we've Since run. Since March 2020. About copyright and online learning at a time of uncertainty and just general great conversations about copyright and keeping everybody up to date. Yeah. So we're delighted to be back here again um, to have uh, many regulars joining us. And to have our guest with us. And a great who's guest. going to be talking about copyright and artificial intelligence. So we're, we're gonna, really looking forward to. We'll come on to that in a moment. So this is just the overview of what we've got. We've got quite a few bits of copyright news, some, some news items, many events coming up, many exciting events. But as you say, we have Margarita Vindish here uh, joining us from Zurich to talk about copyright AI and artistic works a very hot topic absolutely uh, and we're going to dig into some of that yeah so what's happened since we've last met we've got a couple of points here these are I think these are health and well-being related yeah aren't they? we're definitely yeah we're, uh, we're, it's not not January anymore but it's February so but we're still trying to keep ourselves happy and healthy and we should and say now. this 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 webinar is not sponsored so these products that we've been <laughs> they were entirely our choice but but I mean many people are horrified by my choice of footwear here which are the vibrant five fingers in a way to... I think I think I think we need some comments appearing in the chat that, that of what people think actually I think it's one of those things if you don't if, let them see them in real life if, if you know about if you know you know right. and if you're not in the club then you might find them horrific but actually they are they're great right excellent and, and and but you've been you've also been doing something to improve your I have yeah there. yeah I've discovered I'm telling everybody about the benefits of taking uh, turmeric or turmeric or whatever you want to call it so mm -hmm. this is this is something that I started taking about three weeks ago I felt like a new woman you so, indeed yes so just just recommending a couple of things there if and we got some Lisa, maybe not the shoes Lisa Lisa help. says barefoot shoes all the way she's mm. she's in she's in the know okay um, OK, right. So we just to say we have a uh, archive of all the previous webinars and blogs on the copyrightliteracy.org website, also on Alt's YouTube channel. Yep. And um, um, we've got some links going in there. Thank you very much, Greg. Oh, yes. Thank you. And here we go. It's time for Copyright News. <laughs> so news item number one. Uh, the UK government has axed its plans to broaden the text and data mining exceptions. So this was news we brought you a while back that there were plans to broaden this out to allow commercial text and data mining mm. under copyright exceptions. Um, and they have chosen not to do that. Um, Interesting process. They had a consultation. Yes. And then they just made their decision and then they reversed their decision. Yes. So, so I mean, that pro that's a whole other conversation really mm. about the process of lawmaking, um, advocacy and lobbying. Yeah. Um, but certainly I think something that we will likely be returning to yeah. in our conversation later on today, because text and data mining computational analysis is so central fundamental to the area of artificial intelligence. Yeah. Uh, but that's hot off the press. Um, this is also hot off the press. It is. Um, it's up on the uh, the copyright literacy blog. It's the annual report um, of the activities that we've been doing um, under the auspices of the Alt Copyright and Online Learning Special Interest Group for 2022. So if you want to know what we've been up to in addition to running these webinars, which mm -hmm. obviously feature, um, then uh, that's the place to go. Have a check out our annual report. Absolutely. Um, the next uh, news item is an event, the Knowledge Rights 21 program. We've been featuring quite a lot of the work they've been doing. Mm. Um, they are holding a, an event on flexible copyright exceptions next week. Yeah, that 13th. is on, it's on the 13th, which yeah. is Monday. I it think. is. Yeah. 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 Um, so that, again, is going to be uh, a really useful and interesting uh, discussion there about yeah. flexible copyright exceptions in different jurisdictions around the world and how copyright i think they've got emily hudson talking haven't they as well i, I think. believe so yes. um today hello emily mm. um so looking forward to that one 
next news story. Yeah, next up. So um, last year, for the first time um, in the UK, we uh, ran a number of events during um, what's called Fair Dealing or Fair Use Week. It started in the US um, and we're really excited to be running an event um, in conjunction with the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies. It's going to be on the 20th of February and we've got a fantastic speaker, Amanda uh, Wakaruk, who is the scholarly communications University of Alberta. Um, and uh, we're also going to be joined um, by uh, Kyle K. Courtney, who Kyle, will be coming along. Kyle himself. Yeah, so that is um, now available for booking. We've put a link in um, on the ILAS website if you want to join it. It's a webinar, so open to all, and it'll be uh, five o'clock in the evening. Um, so just the kind of thing you want to you know, unwind on a Monday. Absolutely. Uh, Amanda's <laughs> a fantastic speaker. Some of you yeah. will have... have the work that we've been doing with her um, we're really looking forward to this session uh, but that's not the only fair dealing week yeah. session coming up so uh the girl copyright group uh it's copyright and legal group so that's the scottish uh it, it, remind us what scale stands for it's your <laughs> university and research libraries group isn't it um and, yeah. and i've put together yet again another fantastic program here uh, with some with some really great speakers, we've got um, Zoe Crocida who spoke to us about filter um, upload filters yeah. um, and the relationship to the digital single market. We've got Emily Hudson talking about the work she's doing, looking into uh, uh, scholarly monographs and open the, access. Uh, and open, open access, absolutely. Uh, so really looking forward to that one. Yeah, yeah. So lots of things to put in your diary if you want to go along. And another event. Another event. So this is one. What is Oxford? Oxford, the Oxford Festival of Open Scholarship. This is one of the key events that the team I'm part of, the Open Scholarship Support Team at the University of Oxford, based in the Bodleian Libraries, um, does a two week event where we primarily promote things to Oxford researchers and students and everyone who is, works there and is part of the Oxford family. But this is an external event that will be happening in real life in person at the Western Library at the Bodleian Libraries but the reason why it's quite short notice is because we've actually been working on the feasibility of running it as a hybrid event where people can remote in and I'm, I'm delighted to say that we are running it as a remote uh, event haven't yet got the bookings up there so what um, Greg has posted into the chat is uh, an expression of wish interest or expression of interest for and we'll send out the invitations but we'll also do it on all the the mailing lists copy copy soon. excellent but That's it's a discussion great. about whether the copyright form is necessary to achieve an open access future we have uh, professor john walinski from stanford talking about that asun estefe who some of you will have heard on the uh, this webinar yeah. she's, she's a friend of this webinar and uh, did a great copyright waffle We've she got did. Chris Banks from Imperial and Are Andy Redmond you from OUP. Going to perform the song as well. The song about Asun yes. coming to the UK. Yes. And in, uh, I think you should be there taking your guitar. We, we, will, we will see. We'll see whether that fits into the Bodleian context or not. Yeah, I think that's the Western Ivory. That would go down well. Um, uh, yeah, a bit yeah. more rock and roll. I'll, I'll, make, I'll make those notes. But, but that one's really exciting. Um, Excellent. But that's not the end of all the exciting no, things, is it's it? it's not. It's not. Um, We're going to be um, speaking at the end of March um, at the uh, University of London's um, RIDE conference, which is Research in Distance Education. Um, so it's run by their Centre for Online and Distance Education. And um, there is going to be a panel at the end of uh, the Tuesday, which I think is the 28th of March. Um, where we're going to be looking at um, open education mm. and kind of how how we can kind of turn that into sort of from theory into practice. And there'll be um, a lineup um, of speakers that Chris and I are just two of the members of. Um, but the conference program is now up on the website and it's available for bookings. And I believe it's being run as a hybrid event as mm. well. But I believe there isn't a registration fee if anyone's in London and they want to come along to that conference. Yeah. But even that's not the end of the exciting news, is it? Um, if it couldn't get any more exciting. At this point, I needed party poppers. Oh, right. OK, we don't have any party poppers. Can many, you play the theme tune? Many. Uh, the Ice Pops the theme. The Ice Pops theme tune. I think we might need to get this together. Yeah. Uh, we don't actually have an Ice Pops theme tune, do we? We don't, no. But the International Copyright Literacy Event, the Playful Opportunities for Practitioners and Scholars, many people here are aware of it. It is back. It's coming back. 
it's coming back with a vengeance it's going to be brilliant it's happening in glasgow at the end of july we are partnering with create the research center for copyright and the creative economy whose work is it's going to be a bit like is, a festival uh, isn't we're, it we're thinking we, about it as a festival a, in, a festival of copyright camping, literacy on-site camping as well I don't know, Glasgow in July? Yeah. I mean, maybe not in the middle of a city. Okay, uh, okay. Um, I'm but, just thinking of, you know, the pyramid stage and all, you know, it's sort of, if you haven't got a ticket for Glastonbury, this is the next best thing. I, I would say it probably is, yeah. yeah. I mean, we've got, we've got one keynote confirmed, who is uh, Professor Nick Whitten from the University of Durham. Uh, Nick is one of the leading uh, experts in playful learning. So we're returning to the concept of playfulness and games and gaming industry we know create have a lot of ties and in, 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 in uh, glasgow and scotland there's an awful lot of creative stuff in, yeah. in the game industry space so we're delighted to be doing that more details coming but please put the uh, or we, we want call for contributions is open we want your yes. contributions to share your creative ideas about copyright education uh, the booking is not yet Quite no, the, book, open, the book is not quite open. But it's uh, save the date and think about if you want to come and speak at the event and uh, also kind of watch this space for more. We will yeah. get the bookings up in the next couple of weeks. So before we move on, I just want to acknowledge James James Bennett, your, your comment about ride and shoegazing. Yes, that no, noted. Um, uh, I don't think there'll be lots of sort of swirly psychedelic indie uh, guitar noise at that particular <laughs> event, but maybe we could we could introduce it. I don't know. Another festival. Uh, another festival. Yeah. Another time. Let's uh, turn all academic conferences into festivals. Now it's quarter past. It is. It's time to move on. Yes. And we are absolutely delighted to be um, welcoming our guest today, Margarita Vindish, uh, who is a PhD candidate at the Centre for Law and Economics um, at ETH Zurich. Uh, we met Margarita actually when we were in Glasgow at Create, at, yeah, Create, at, Create, yeah. at the Advanced Research Centre. Yes. Um, I had a really great conversation with her. Uh, now, uh, Margarita's area of specialism is artificial intelligence and copyright, particularly as it relates to art mm. and artists. Um, so we won't say too much more to steal um, Margarita's thunder. We, uh, we've spoken to her about the links between copyright and online learning, which is what we're covering and the sort of artwork and an and, and art world that, that Margarita looks at. So there are some links there, but we're really gonna hand over to Margarita to share uh, with us what she's been working on mm. um, and give us some insight into what is clearly a very hot topic, with a lot of people talking a lot of stuff about AI, um, mm. and, and we're really glad to have her putting it into some kind of sense and make Absolutely, okay. yeah. So, get... Margarita, are you are you receiving us? Can we hear you? Yes, I'm here. Excellent, right? Excellent. Yeah. I'm going to going to stop the uh, sharing our slides. Sharing our slides. Oh. Um, we will get your slides up. And the floor is yours. So uh, also, um, so thank you, Jane and Chris, first for the very nice introduction and hello to everyone. I'm very happy to be here and to talk a bit about the pressing question regarding copyright law and AI and also about uh, the, my background and my research in this topic as a PhD candidate. And um, to give you uh, a bit of a background um, for myself. So I have a classical legal background and um, where I was already like um, fascinated by copyright law and intellectual property law in general. But what many um, of the people don't know is that I also have a creative background. So I went to fashion school before my legal studies. I have I come from a very artistic family. And so now the PhD um, allows me to combine the creative part with the legal aspects and um, doing research on that and also to connect the different stakeholders such as artists, uh, AI developers and legal scholars as myself, which is amazing. So I love what I do. And um, everyone hears about AI uh, in different contexts um, are most almost every day in the news. 
and how it is disrupting the creative industries and the work of artists, but also what positive impacts AI has on um, their work and the future of uh, creation. And then there are also some questions regarding uh, copyright infringement and uh, the future of creators in general. So it is a very exciting topic to uh, research on and um, to uh, yeah, dive deeper. And for today's webinar, um, we will first briefly get into the basics of copyright law, um, especially in the digital age, and then dive deeper um, into copyright law in the context of AI and discuss the questions of copyright authorship and copyright infringement and then also what are the possible remedies and how to um, continue in the future. To get everyone on the same page, um, copyright law um, provides creators of original work um, with a bundle of exclusive rights be it for literal, musical, artistic works that are fixed in any tangible medium. And in most countries, the duration is the life of the author plus 70 years. And uh, it is limited to the expression of ideas uh, and facts, but not um, the, so the ideas itself or functions or effects are uh, not protected and they fall automatically into the public domain. And next to the economic rights uh, as copyrights, there are the moral rights, um, which uh, give the creators also personal rights, like the right to be um, attributed or the right to object to any alteration of their original work. And we already saw in the last decade that technology significantly shaped the way creative works are produced, distributed and used. We have seen an increase in created works that are also then made available to consumers. And we have seen a decrease of costs such as in production, distribution and advertising. And already back then or until now, one of the most pressing question was um, how do we identify and prosecute copyright infringement online? And this got now even more difficult in the context of AI, where the first question is, um, can the output of uh, generative AI models, can it be copyrighted? And if yes, um, who owns the copyright, so who's the author of the, of the output. And also regarding the question of copyright infringement, is there any infringement happening? Okay. Do, sorry? Okay, well, there was no question. Um, do copyright owners where their work is being used to train the AI have any legal claims over the model or over the content? that it creates. And based on those questions, um, we can then also look at how should we deal with the consequences of AI in the creative industries, what kind of legal constraints um, or restraints should or could be put in place, and also how could the relationship between AI developers and copyright owners, but also the users of the AI could look like. And what makes it even more complex is there are different stakeholders involved with different interests. So we have the creators whose work is being used to train the model. Then we have the AI developers who develop the model. Um, often it is an AI company. And then we have the user of the AI, which are also often creators that use AI as a mere tool. And then we have society as a whole. And um, to tackle the first question I mentioned uh, regarding copyright authorship, we so far have human authorship as a guiding principle. And 
there are three um, examples uh, you see uh, in the in the US uh, context of copyright law where um, you might remember the monkey selfie case where um, a photographer gave a camera to a monkey and the monkey took all the pictures in the jungle and there um, the Court of Appeal of the Ninth Circuit said that those pictures are not copyrightable because there is no human as an author. And also uh, in the case of registering a work, the US Copyright Office so far said in one case that there is no registration possible for a work that is created with an AI. Um, in the case of Tala and in the case of Castanova, which you see on the um, right side, um, there there has been a registration of a, of a novel where after the registration, it has been revealed that the images were uh, generated with an AI. And so there is the question now, should the Copyright Office um, remove the registration or leave it? And so this is not clear yet, but very interesting to see how they will pursue. And we can assume that also computer generated works have human authors. So far, we just don't know who it might be. Um, and the UK, for example, is one of the very few countries that already protect AI generated works where um, the UK uh, Copyright Act states that the author is the person by whom the arrangement necessary for the creation of the work are undertaken. However, it is not clear what are um, the arrangements that needs to happen, what are what is necessary. Um, so this is still up for discussion. And uh, there's also a shorter protection period for the works. So it's the life of the author plus 50 years, such as for photographs or databases, and also more rights are denied for those works. And so the general question is, what does it mean to be an author and when should creative works be protected? And here um, you see two pictures uh, of images where one is created with uh, an AI and one is created um, solely by a human being with maybe other technology or more traditional tools, but it is not clear from just looking at the pictures or at the images, which tools were being used and um, if AI was involved or not. But in both cases, and I can reveal um, the question of um, the AI generated work afterwards, but in most cases, also when work is generated within AI, a lot of effort goes into um, creating also the output, not only the model, but then also working with the AI to um, generate something. And you have many creative decisions along the way, which are important for the originality of a work so that it is protected by copyright. And there also um, my current research project focuses on where I look at the question if um, whether the attachment between artists and the work depend on the involvement of AI. And I focus on text to image models, models in the uh, context of visual arts. And in order to measure relevant factors um, or measure the input by human being, there are several relevant factors such as the initiative to create the work, the investment that goes into creating the work, and then also the extent to which the arrangement shaped the work, um, the form and um, how they are responsible for the materialization of the work. And also one um, factor is the proximity to the act of the final creation, which is um, also interesting because um, often, so copyright law has like different theories underlying, such as the utilitarian approach, which is more incentive-based, 
but then also in Europe you have the um, approach of uh, the labor theory uh, which states that um, it is about the investment that goes into uh, creating the work and um, one should own the fruits of their own labor their intellectual labor in this case and also the personality of the artist that is being expressed is um, much more relevant in continental Europe. And so there are different implications of a weaker or stronger bond um, to works that are created with AI compared to works that are um, created with other technology, but also more traditional tools like um, brushes on a canvas, for example. And there I'm working on an experiment at the moment to uh, answer this question and work together with uh, different artists. Um, which brings us also to another important question in the context of AI and copyright law, uh, the question of copyright infringement, where um, it is not clear at the moment if there is a copyright infringement. Um, for example, when the AI is trained on databases that consists of um, original works that are copyrighted, but without the permission of the rights holders. And then also if there is a comp copyright infringement, who infringes the copyright? Is it the person or the group that um, puts together the database? Is it the, the group that uses the database um, or maybe also even the user that uses the AI model? So it is not clear if there's an infringement and then also at what point does the infringement happen? Um, importantly, copyright infringement is the actual copying, copying of the copyrighted work without permission. And at the moment, uh, lawsuits are already flying in. So we have Getty Images uh, suing Stability AI. And um, Getty Images is one of the huge uh, stock image uh, platforms where they state that uh, Stability AI um, use their work like millions of works to train their model, but also artists um, are coming together to sue different um, AI companies. And um, so it is very interesting to see how this will involve in the future um, uh, because there's a lot of uncertainty and that's also why so far um, people are also uh, were a bit um, more uh, on the safe side when it comes to suing uh, different um, AI companies because it is very costly and you just don't know the, um, the outcome. And often, so for example, in the case of Getty Images, they stated that they're not interested in any financial damages or stopping the development the development of AI art tools, but they find it important to create like a new legal status quo because of all this uncertainty. And um, what is also interesting to do uh, also for you is uh, to use uh, Have I Been Trained? That's a website where you can insert an image and see if um, it is a part of the Lion database, which is also the one Stability AI um, created or used for their model. So um, this is or might be also very relevant in the future. And it's also fun to, to play already with it now. Um, or very relevant already for the creators. And um, to tackle the, the question of copyright infringement, um, it is also important to notice um, that there are exceptions to copyright. For example, in the US, you have the fair use doctrine where Section 107 of the Copyright Act lists some of the fair use cases, but then also um, says that 
four factors need to be um, in place in order to have a fair use case as a defense to copyright infringement, such as um, the second work is transformative, so the purpose and character of the use has somehow changed, then also the nature of the copyrighted work compared to the second work, and um, the degree of substantial uh, substantial similarity is also an important factor and um, the effect the use upon uh, the potential market for the value of the copyrighted work and in the European Union um, uh, but also in Europe in general most countries have uh, only an exhaustive list what is considered uh, an exception to copyright which includes also text and data mining, um, which is uh, the key to uh, the question, more or less, because AI um, companies or the developers or the people who set, who create the databases, they scrape the internet and um, get all the images in the case of text to image models, but also all the uh, information in general when it comes to um, chat GPT, for example. So they scrape the internet and um, extract the, the data. And this then creates the database that is used to train the model in order to create the output. And there, um, the European Union has um, three uh, or two articles related to text and data mining um, uh, in the uh, DSM directive, in the copyright directive, where Article 3, for example, states that um, text and data mining is um, allowed for um, purposes of scientific research without any um, permission uh, of the rights holders. And, um, Article 4 uh, states that it is possible for any purpose, but there needs to be an opt-out provision for rights holders. And there, um, it is now, again, like, there, it, there is uncertainty because we um, see also some gray areas where uh, AI companies, such as stability, AI um, funded, um, a research group to undertake the model uh, and uh, the model training and also a small nonprofit organization which was then a uh, lion for the database to create their data um, sets for training the model which now contains about uh, 5.8 billion images so it's huge and um, Importantly, also, most of the, the research that is going on in AI um, models and uh, the generation of um, AI art, for example, is um, open source. So it is very easy also for other researchers to then generate um, new models and train them with the data sets that are um, existing. And so there's the question of balancing the rights between rights holders and um, also the, the freedom to people for people to innovate. And potential remedies can uh, um, or are very complex at the moment to, to tackle because we have to consider first that there is like a complex interplay between the different stakeholders that are involved with often different interests. And on top of that, we have huge differences already within the or between the creative industries on a national and an international level. For example, the um, music industry is already really complex. Um, and the software industry works again very different and um, the industry of visual arts uh, is 
now very challenged in this context with AI models. And so to allow uh, AI to, to develop further and to promote the innovation, but also giving credit or compensation to the creators whose works make the field possible, there are different solutions, for example, fair learning, which is based on um, the fair use case where um, depending then on um, is it fair to use the uh, the data or not in the US with the fair use doctrine, but uh, also then in Europe with the different um, exceptions to copyright. But we could also think of um, a market-based licensing solution where, for example, again, in the music industry after the Napster case, where it was a huge um, case regarding uh, copyright infringement from peer-to-peer -peer, um, services and the download of, of music uh, illegally. But there, Spotify, for example, found a way of um, bringing together the rights holders of the original music, then also the users of um, the tool and negotiating something that works for everyone. But we could also think of funds to compensate individuals whose work is used by AI companies to train their models, um, where this is already happening a bit um, in the case of uh, of digital devices, for example, where um, there is a certain fee that is put on the device when you buy it, that goes then to the collective society and then distributed among the, um, the creators, which could also be a solution for um, the AI tools in the future. But um, there's still very uh, open questions and um, it's also the question of should we regulate it now already or to, to what extent or should we still lean back a bit and observe what um, is developing and how much AI really influences um, the creative industry and uh, the creators, for example, in case of their um, creation processes. So yeah, a lot to uh, look forward to and uh, to discuss also not only today in the webinar but um, also in the future and with this i thank you for your attention and um yeah looking forward to your questions now and uh, also if you want to contact me after the webinar feel free to write me an email um yeah Thank you, Margarita. That was absolutely brilliant. Yeah, uh, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Put your email there in the chat so people can, can grab it. Um, so many, many things to pick up on, so many thoughts that come. Uh, and I think when anyone starts thinking about artificial intelligence, relationship to creativity and regulation of that, you just start your head starts spinning so i mean the, the work that you're doing must is must be fascinating um mm. and to, to dig into all of that so i think i'm um, going to pick up on some of the questions i think the first thing i wanted to cover though actually is you mentioned for example uh, the united kingdom here in the, in the uk we have provisions around ownership of computer generated works and we've had that in our legislation for some time um and i guess we had you say it's an assumption there that there are human owners of computer generated works because it is the humans or the organizations that are behind creating that computer software the model whatever it is that's, that's creating the work the output of it and um, what's the difference between where we were there i mean were 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 people fairly comfortable and confident in understanding how that worked from a legal perspective back when that computer generated works legislation was first interpreted and what's the difference to where we are now is it simply that the technology is so sophisticated that it's 
a, possible to create works that are indistinguishable from human created works? Um, I think it, so as you said, it's very complex because there are different stakeholders involved and also AI is used not only by users that don't consider themselves maybe creative or an artist, but it is also used um, by artists as a tool. And so there, I think, um, coming back to the labor theory and the investment that goes into creating a work, there um, there are differences in um, in the advancement in, of technologies, but I think you can still, um, even though if it's not um, distinguishable, if it's like a human being or um, a machine that is somehow the tool or the the one that um, moves and uh, creates the work, it is uh, there are still many creative steps and creative decisions along the way where you can see AI as a tool, which most of the artists do, I think. And um, there it should then not make a difference. What is difficult is that um, when you just play around with it, or there has been also now a case in um, a competition with photographs, for example, where the winner of the competition um, revealed afterwards that the work was created with an AI. Mm. And so there, all the other artists then said, okay, no, this is not, in, not okay. Um, mm. This should be this should not be allowed because every other artist um, put a lot of effort in creating the, the image with the camera, which is also technology, which simplified the paintings, for example. And already back then, everyone said that, no, we should not protect images created by uh, cameras, um, which is now long ago. And today it's totally normal that photographs are also copyrighted. And I think mm. there, even if the first prize went to um, an image that was created with an AI, it doesn't mean automatically that there was not also human investment. So I think uh, the, the point you make about photography is, is fascinating as well, because we and then we spoke to Lionel Bentley, Professor Lionel Bentley on our podcast a while back, and he talked about the moral panic and the sort of conceptual idea of people capturing light itself. And that it yes. threw, you know, back in the end of when the 19th the century, of photography, yeah. um, I, I, I think following on from the idea of competition and whether or not it's regarded as cheating, mm. um, clearly there's been a lot going on in the online learning space around using AI tools as a way of uh, students uh, taking a shortcut, yeah. just doing a quick thing and then the computer does all the work for them. Um, to what extent is this, are you aware that this being discussed in art schools? What kind of link is there, should there be between legal scholars like yourself uh, and with an artistic interest and talking about this in a critical way within our educational institutions? I think in general, it's especially now also with ChatGPT, for example, but also in art schools with AI art generator tools, it is really important to not only or not just banning those tools from the education system, but to find a way to bring them into the education system and make critical thinking more important and finding also ways to integrate the tools that are available, not only with AI, but also with digital technology in general to um, make people understand what does it mean to use technology as a working tool to use to also um, learn how to um, how to integrate the the tools in their work where it is maybe um, also relevant or much more informative but i think for this especially the education system has to evolve much more um, to uh, 
find a way that um, you use the tools that are available in a way where it makes sense and to also critically um, question the tools. Where do we want to use it? Why do we want to use it? And how do we want to use it? And um, I also like during my or between my bachelor and my master's, I worked in um, in digital education where um, we provided Austrian schools with um, the devices, but also with workshops on how they could integrate the di digital technology that is available because we are surrounded by it already in the daily life. So it only makes sense to use and to learn to learn how to use them in the education system where it is a safe space and um, where the knowledge and the connection can be created much more easily. Yeah, that's really, that's really interesting. I think it's absolutely, I mean, I've, I've tuned into a couple of um, talks that have been happening this week in higher education about chat GPT. I've got and a I link think, to share. I've got the link to share from the Oxford yeah, for Teaching and Learning. I'll find that. Yeah, but I think I think that's absolutely, you know, it's it's we've got kind of got to accept that these tools exist and, you know, teach people how to use them, haven't we, for 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 kind of learning, but also to reward the kind of the critical thinking, which is what we want our students to do. Um, there's a question from Deborah Fern. So we've actually got lots of questions in the chat. So we're going to try and get to some of them. But I'm kind of going back. Um, one of the first questions Deborah asked was about. Um, Can you still hear me because you're okay you're gone <laughs> Deborah you can um, ask the question just like this if you want to yeah hello I, I can't hear Jane at the moment but I guess yeah, my <laughs> yeah my my question was really about how relevant are the terms and conditions of the providers of the AI software um, when it comes to who owns copyright between the software provider and the user of that software. I guess for context, we are running an images and research competition at the university. And we are really kind of try, we're trying to determine whether the, the creators who are submitting their images and telling us up front they're created by AI, whether we should be attributing them and they own them, or we should be concerned about what rights the, the model creators have. And we have looked at various terms and conditions <laughs> in that respect. Yeah. So, so far, um, every AI company is doing more or less what they want and like they try to be as safe as possible with incorporating um, in their terms of conditions often that um, the user has uh, all the right to to use the um, the images that were created but some rights also then remain with the AI company but at the moment it is just not clear so I would say that what is in the um, what is stated in the terms and conditions of um, each uh, company, for example, stable um, diffusion, where um, it, it might change in the future, depending on those lawsuits, for example. But at the moment, it is just unclear. So yeah, but no, that, that's you can helpful. take them into account or not, but yeah. yeah, I think I think most of the examples we've seen there 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 the user is the the rights are assigned to the user in what their their output is. I think the only example I saw really that was different was the Shutterstock AI. Yeah, often it's it is only licensed to the user, so um, ownership or the AI company then states that they have ownership licenses all the rights to um, to the user of the tool. 
but this is the question um, I'm also very interested at the moment to research because it is not clear who is the person necessary for um, all the arrangements made. Thank you, Margarita, Thank and thanks, Deborah, for stepping in um, there. That was very helpful. Was Sorry, we lost a bit of connectivity here. We're not quite sure what happened. If but... it happens again, we'll switch to a different device. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, more questions. I think there might be in the in the chat as well, aren't there? Do you want to pick up um, the next one, Chris? Um, just a comment here from Jess about encouraging um, them at uh, Manchester, thinking about. Um, uh, art and authenticity in a, in, a, in a philosophical way. I think that's one of the things I find we do go, there's, there's a strong ethical element and philosophical one that again makes us, it's all those kind of age old questions, what it is to be human, what, what <laughs> and, and, and what art is and what it's about and what it's for. Uh, yeah. So I imagine you spend quite a lot of time thinking about that sort of thing, Margarita, or do you spend your time thinking really focusing on a kind of legal and economic question. No, no, no. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it is an interesting question. And I'm also uh, doing interviews with artists uh, at the moment to also get some more background. And there are artists who work with technology in general, or more and more, and to um, not only use it as a tool, but also to showcase or like to have again like a critical view on the technology because I think that's also what art is about to some extent that we take what is happening in uh, um, in the real world in society at the moment and then somehow um, transform it into art and so there are artists who already use technology in different ways and now this is just like another tool to create, to express their ideas, and they still sit 20 hours or more um, on that specific uh, work to create. Mm. But then there are also artists who, uh, yeah, who have like a more um, negative ma view maybe on the technology and maybe also on how society is changing and evolving mm. as a whole with the technology, but also there, I think art is a very good tool to showcase um, the issues of society and of uh, digital technology. Absolutely, yeah. Um, it's just an interesting question I've spotted from, um, uh, from uh, Evelyn uh, Webster. Have AI companies violated the terms and conditions of social media or image hosting companies if they scrape the users' uploaded content? We were just having a conversation as well about music, weren't we? If you sort of reuse a lot of music, whether mm. that's done under license or, you know, because um, I, I, I've heard of somebody who went through all the works of the Beatles to yeah. write new songs. And I think related to that, there's also a question from Becky about would artists have the opportunity to remove their works from the database? So can we cover those at the same time? Mm. To what extent is it, a, is it a, a breach of the license terms? And then what can you do about it if you do find something is incorporated? So there uh, comes the, the exception to copyright with uh, text data mining into um, place because so it is legal to scrape and to collect data in the case of um, research activities where you don't need the permission. So if a research company uh, or if a research group of, of a university um, scrapes and um, scrapes the internet, collects the data, um, trains an AI model where um, DALI also started as this, um, there should not be any um, copyright violation, but then it gets difficult if the tool is then also commercialized and um, being used by a company, for example, to make money from it. And yeah. there, um, another uh, exception in the European Union, in the copyright directive at least, is that you can scrape um, and do text and data mining for any purpose, but you need to provide an opt-out um, possibility for rights holders. 
or you license uh, or you get like data that is licensed and where you have to license from it, which is difficult to, or at the moment at least, it is difficult to do that on a large scale. Um, but with the opt out version, um, this might be possible in the future. Then the question is also, is this really enough for the right holders that um, where their works are being used to train the model? Yeah, mm. open question. Open question. And, uh, yeah, and, and an area that is moving very, very quickly. Margarita, we've, we've yeah. run out of time. What I'd like to say is, I mean, will you share with us the outcome of your research? How, how long have you got left yeah, on definitely. your PhD definitely. studies? When are you due yeah. to complete? I still have about two years, so. Oh, excellent. There's well, OK, well, we'll we'll stay in touch. And, we'll, absolutely. And, and that was an absolutely fascinating overview of where we are with things. Everybody is thinking about this and talking about it all the time. So thanks for. Yeah, for thank you so time. much for joining yeah, us. Thank really you for having me. Yeah, we hope maybe we'll be able to come to Ice Pops, our conference. Maybe, maybe you'll you'll come, back, come back to Glasgow. Who knows? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, lovely. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, right. In the remaining one minute, we will we just finish up. Um, we've got a couple of things to share with you before uh, it's time to go. Yeah, we've got lots and lots of thank you coming in in the chat. I don't know yeah. if you've had a chance to look at it, Marguerite, but I think everyone found that really I'm looking at really it now. Helpful. Yeah, 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 lots and lots of chat. So, so oh, we've revealed the one last thing too. Early. Right, okay. So we <laughs> have uh, our next uh, webinar is going to be a closed discussion about the CLA license. Um, and what we're looking for within the UK higher education sector, because we are uh, about to start negotiations for the license, which starts as of um, 1st of August 2024. Yep, we've got our first meeting next week. We, we do, so looking forward to get back into the swing of that. Uh, after that, we've got our Becoming a Copyright Specialist uh, theme coming around again. We have two speakers. We have two so speakers far. lined up. We are looking for a third, if anybody is interested in giving their story about how they got dragged into the world of copyright and how what it is that keeps them within the world and to stop them running away uh, <laughs> then please let us know and then we're delighted that in may matt voigt from ifla the international federation of library associations who's creating what is turning into a, a real blockbuster copyright news newsletter that he does yeah. for their copyright and legal matters group he's going to be sharing the highlights recent topical things things that he's really found interesting over the last few months that's going to be a fantastic. And we haven't yet episode. scheduled anything for June. But we haven't. I think, uh, July is going to be a busy month. July is going to be quite busy. We'll yeah. probably take that off. Yeah. We're not taking it off, are we? We're doing ice pops. No. But if there are any topics, thoughts. Uh, <laughs> yeah. For June webinar, on, he wants please. to jump back yeah, to. Yeah. Let's know. Yeah. Um, okay. So, one last thing. Play that jingle, Chris. No, uh, don't. No, we're not going to play the jingle. That takes no, too long. A, yeah, the jingle goes on forever. One last thing. So, um, um part of the move towards this kind of hybrid working um in my office uh, at city i'm kind of clearing out my desk because we're looking to have a we've got a hot desking system in place and one of the things i found in there was um some sort of six seven year olds rather stale copyright fortune cookies that so I made. should we see what they actually say on them yeah let's have a look yeah looking yeah. for more help about copyright Visit copyrightuser.org for advice, videos, and many useful resources. Yeah. Copyright user, brilliant website. Still um, around. Bart Maletti, yeah. creative director at Create, and all the Create people that have done that. And also, there is a new version of it coming. There Copyright is. Copyright EU. Yes. yes. So yes. Um, that's very exciting. And then the other one. The second one was about taking images from Google. May infringe copyright. And it okay. was telling you to use, I think that Creative Commons search doesn't actually exist anymore. But obviously, the principle okay. still applies. Yes. So the moral of the story is that fortune cookies might go stale, but copyright, copyright doesn't. never does. Well, how would you encapsulate copyright AI and art into one snappy fortune cookie statement? <laughs> probably be quite hard. I'll have a bit it? of a think about that yeah, one. Yeah. So. But I tell you what. Just get ChatGPT to do it. Oh, that's a good. Yeah. There we go. Write me some copyright. Oh, shall we get it to do it this afternoon? Write us some copyright um, fortune cookie mottos. See mm. what it comes up with. Sean has pointed out it's openverse.org. There's given us. A ah, link. excellent. Yes. Uh, thank you. Brilliant. Very much. OK, well, I think we will leave things there. Thank you again, for everyone, for turning up again. Thanks yeah, again thanks to Margarita lot. for such an excellent presentation. And 
uh, we wish you a lovely weekend. Yeah. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye.